a good turnout for this event, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I noticed that uh, when you talk about religion, I mean, I've always always told you don't talk about religion in politics, and then we start talking about religion at conferences like this, and we can tear religion to pieces and have great fun with it. But you mentioned a political opinion, <laughs> and especially anything in defense of the libtards. <laughs> and you got some enemies. So I'm going to express my political opinion today, and you're welcome to disagree because you have the right to be wrong. <laughs> We've heard an awful lot about, a lot, an awful lot recently about making America great again. And first of all, that implies that America is not great now. But all of the very same people who say they want to make America great again unanimously declare that America is already the greatest country in the world right now that it was years ago, too, and that it always was, ever since it was founded 243 years ago. So how can it be great again if it was always the greatest there's ever been and it's never been less than the best? <laughs> uh, there are those who say that America is not so great anymore, but the ones who give objective, numeric reasons to show that, paradoxically, are not the ones who say they want to make it great again. Though, again, paradoxically, that entirely separate and diametrically opposed group who say that America is not so great anymore are also the ones trying to undo or correct the damage that is further diminishing whatever greatness we might once have had, while those who say they want to make it great again are only making it worse and worse as each day goes by. While the ideals that our country was founded on were indeed great, and most of the provisions in our Bill of Rights lend to America's greatness too, and I think everyone, most everyone, would agree with that. There are still those who say that the U.S. never actually achieved the greatness it originally promised. Because right from the start, it was supposed to be a self-evident truth that all men are created equal. However, they did not say that all people are created equal, because at that time, no woman was equal to any man. Women didn't get the right to vote until 1920. Amazingly, that's still not uh, even 100 years ago. One year off. And while women have been gaining increasing equivalence since then in various areas, getting the right to vote already put them ahead of those who originally peopled the whole of this continent by the millions until waves of white colonists flooded in, enacting centuries of inexcusable atrocities and a deliberately orchestrated genocide, decimating the indigenous population, reducing it to a status of a racial minority on two continents, on a half of the world that they once had all to themselves. And when women got the, the right to vote, Native Americans were not even citizens, not of their ancestral home anymore, nor of the new government either. They were treated as foreign intruders on their own land, and they were denied our Bill of Rights until 1968, when I was five years old. That's how recent that was. In fact, when I was a kid, the marriage I now have with a woman of biracial heritage was illegal in this country. The law of the land then prohibited interracial marriage. And that error wasn't corrected until 1967. So what happened to the self-evident truth that all men were created equal, that they were endowed by their natural or divine creator, whatever that would turn out to be, with certain unalienable rights? The Founding Fathers knew when they wrote that that they had already alienated those supposedly unalienable rights from their slaves. And while some of the Founders held noble aspirations about emancipation, the sad fact is that the Southern states wouldn't join the Union if they couldn't keep their slaves. And the Union needed the South so much that it allowed a contradiction in the Constitution such that human rights were alienated from African abductees. At best, the slaves only counted as three-fifths of a person. Did anyone think that God created them with that arbitrarily legislated proportion of inequality? Obviously not. The fact is that rights are not given by any of man's imagined deities. They are bestowed or denied at the whim of magistrates, who will only change their minds in the face of overwhelming evidence. Not really. You know. Our lawmakers usually won't change their minds unless faced with overwhelming numbers of outraged constituents threatening rebellion, which the Founding Fathers said was a good thing now and again. 
So what is it that made America great, if it ever was? Is it that we are the richest country in the world? Because that was inarguably true, and I think it still is, although we are losing our advantage. Do you know how we became the richest nation in the world? We were the world's drug dealer. Uncle Sam was the pusher that got everybody hooked on tobacco. And then we controlled marketing and production for hundreds of years on the backs of slave labor. Can we call that great? And maybe we're great because of our military prowess. And not because we've sacrificed our priorities to spend everything we can on more military than we ever really needed, but because the United States was a clear winner in both world wars, also known as the Great Wars. The way Americans did that back then, in the generation known as the greatest generation, my grandparents, was by joining together with women running factories, with every ethnicity fighting side by side at the front. Companies stopped building cars for, commercial, for customers and switched to war machines, while the populace, the populace rationed gasoline, all to contribute to the collective effort. Because Americans then treated war as something we had to win decisively and quickly so that we can get back to peace and prosperity, neither of which should exist for us at home while our nation is at war. Because war should be a concerted effort where all of us should be in it to win it and get it over with. That means it has to be for the right reasons too, which is another advantage we had in World War II. We were clearly the good guys. We had the moral high ground, although I think we are still the only country so far that has ever actually used nuclear weapons against other people. How great does that make us? At least in the Great Wars, we really were there to liberate our allies from the unprovoked aggression of hostile dictators. We weren't also the bad guys who started all this shit in the first place, like we have been for decades since, doing shady deals and covert maneuvers to topple, corrupt, or manipulate foreign powers in a few different parts of the world at once, and always for illicit purposes. We're not the heroes coming to save anyone from tyranny anymore. We are the tyrants now. We're only here to set up puppets and forcibly take over profits from the distribution of drugs and oil. And we've shown that we will compromise all of our own principles to do that. If the United States was ever great, we're not so great anymore. That's one reason why. And no one who says they want to make America great, again, is doing anything to fix that or any of the other errors that, uh, that America's had for so long that has ruined our reputation among nations. Instead, they're exacerbating that situation. There was a time when the United States was made of trailblazing pioneers. So many things were discovered or invented here that we led the educated world and the industrial world, and we were the leaders on the scientific frontier, too. We were producers, innovators, inventors, workers who made things work. But now, we're mostly just consumers who don't even understand the technology we depend upon. Some of us don't even believe in our own greatest achievements. That certainly ain't great. We still have a few bragging rights on a few things compared to some other nations, but we've behaved terribly lately, and we've lost much of what the rest of the world used to admire about us. There's not many people in the rest of the world who would say that the United States is the best country there is or ever was. If we really were, I think others would say so. Some did once upon a time, but not anymore, not since we showed the world our ass. In fact, we elected him. <laughs> when I was a little boy, 10 or 11 years old, way back in 1971, this country was so very different. I remember folks telling me all the reasons why the United States was better than every other country in the world. For example, back then I heard that a number of Christian alarmists complaining that if they had grown up in England, They'd have to be Anglican. The queen is the head of the church and the government, one and the same, and that consequently vicars from the Church of England would lead all the students in prayer, regardless what the student's personal religion was. And there was no way you could get out of that without breaking the law of the land. And the funny thing is, is that the people said that while simultaneously complaining about Madeleine Murray O'Hare having taken prayer out of schools when what she actually did was stop American teachers from doing the same thing the British teachers were doing, forcing forcing children of various different religions to participate in Protestant prayer against their own rights, which was something that wasn't corrected until I was born. Not that my birth had anything to do with it. <laughs> yeah, most of my family were Mormons, and some of them understand why the government needed to be secular. They remember Mormon Execution Order Number 44. 
which was signed by Missouri Governor Lilburn Boggs in 1838. That was a law that allowed American militia, which th at that time meant angry mobs, to hunt down and kill whole families of Mormon men, women, and children simply because they believed in the wrong religion. That's why the Mormons had to flee Illinois and Missouri and run to Utah. What happened to the First Amendment? That Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Well, at least somebody realized how unconstitutional that law was, and it was repealed just 138 years later, in 1976, when I was a teenager. And that reminds me, what is a militia? A militia is defined as a military force that is raised from the civil population to supplement a regular army in an emergency. Now look at the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That means it was never about self-defense. I'm not defending this, I'm just pointing out what it actually meant in the 1700s, that you're supposed to have your guns which today would include you know, high capacity assault rifles and all, for, all that, just in case the, U, the, the United States government needs to draft you into, into their militia. So you should have your guns registered for that purpose so that they know who to call. <laughs> so if they don't need, if the government doesn't need civilian citizens to be in their militia anymore, since we now have the most gross, grossly overbloated military anywhere ever, then maybe they should amend that Bill of Rights accordingly. And personally, I'd rather they train and license anyone with a gun, which would allow them to turn at least half of our grotesque military budget toward rebuilding infrastructure, including an efficient mass transit network, beefing up and completely revising public education, and establishing a national health care system like so many other better countries have already had for decades, though I know some people will call that communist. Back in 1971, I was told that the USA is better than the USSR because at that time, you could go to Canada or Mexico without even having a passport. But in communist Russia, you had to have your papers on you at all times. If a Soviet citizen traveled from one state or district to another, even within his own country, he could be stopped and inspected at any moment. Show me your papers, and they had better be in order. Because if they were not in order, then you would be arrested on the spot and sent away somewhere. So I was alarmed when in May of 2017, Texas Governor Greg Abbott got on Facebook Live and gleefully signed a bill into law that was actually called the Show Your Papers Bill. It grants city police the authority to act as immigration agents so that they can go onto a college campus and just pick out anybody walking along that they think looks foreign. And if that person doesn't have their papers on them proving that they have legal permission to be in this country, they'll be arrested on the spot and may even be shipped away to a country they've never been to, because I've read that that's happened at least once. It used to be that everyone knew that Americans will not negotiate with terrorists. But we do now, don't we? Yeah. Ever since Ronald Reagan. Yeah. It used to be that everyone knew that the American military would never torture prisoners because we're the good guys. But then, George W. Bush opened Gitmo, and now we do. Due process. You remember that? W. undermined that, too, when he issued an executive order allowing the Treasury Department to seize any and all property belonging to individuals who haven't actually done anything wrong but who pose significant risk of committing violent acts. The hell does that mean? Then Trump took that a step further, imprisoning those seeking legal process of asylum and holding them for months without laundry or showers, to say nothing of putting their children in cages for months as well, without education or developmental facilities, and then misplacing them so that we don't even know what cages we put those kids in or where, in what concentration camp, and yes, that is actually what they are, so that those families that never should have been separated can never be reunited. Those children will be adopted out to somebody else. Doesn't that make you proud to be an American? Remember how happy we all were when the Berlin Wall came down? Now just imagine Ronald Reagan saying, Mr. Trump, build up that wall. <laughs> Whenever I hear that we're supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave, it makes me angry and sad because it's just not true anymore.
We started with the slogan, uh, give me liberty or give me death. But since then, we've surrendered many of our freedoms out of fear, which is what this wall is all about. It's funny that those who complain the most about socialism are the ones who can't even tell you what it is. They just know that it's opposed to capitalism. And they have the false idea that socialism is the same thing as communism, which everyone says is evil and that capitalism is good. And while I would not attempt to defend communism, from my perspective, the primary reason why America has lost whatever greatness we could have had now is because of runaway capitalism. It's not regulated, inhibited, or restrained. And corporations are not people. They are literally inhuman. It shouldn't be a choice between capitalism or socialism, either one or the other. There should be an equilibrium where they're mutually linked, each restraining the other in a balance such that everyone can enjoy the benefits of both. In the same sense, our government is a democratic republic. But if it were ever just a democracy, well, it's actually not even that anymore. It's, an, it's a corporate oligarchy now. But if it was ever just a democracy, it would quickly dissolve into mob rule without any regard for the law, which a republic depends upon. And that doesn't mean I'm a centrist by any means. I'm unapologetically leftist. I'm not just left of center. I'm in the center of the left. I know that because I took a half a dozen different evaluations that all put me in the exact same spot on the political compass. But it really, I mean, for all those other questions, it really only comes down to one thing. I am on the left because I care more about human rights than corporate profits. You guys, are in, <laughs> you guys are applauding me in here, but you can tell what they're typing on, on YouTube right now. <laughs> well, the corporations know that they're killing us, and they lie to us about that over and over again, saying that the lead in our gasoline is harmless, that smoking is not a health risk. Do you all remember, anybody old enough to remember both of these things? Okay, and now paid shills on social media are spreading the campaign claim that anthropogenic climate change isn't even really happening. And we all know people who are gullible or stupid enough to believe all these lies. Corporations are not moral entities, and even the founding fathers knew that. Thomas Jefferson himself hoped that we would crush in its birth the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations, which dare already to challenge our government to a trial of strength and, um, and to bid defiance to the laws of their country. That sentiment remains timeless, and it was shared by John Adams, who said that banks have done more injury to the religion, morality, tranquility, prosperity, and even the wealth of the nation than they can have done or ever will do good. Fast forward to 1931, when Will Rogers, the cowboy philosopher, said, here we are in a country with more wheat and more corn, more money in the banks, more cotton, more everything in the world. There's not a product that you can name that we haven't got more of it than any country ever had on the face of the earth, and yet we got people starving. We'll hold the distinction of being the only nation in the history of the world that ever went to the poor house in an automobile. In that same speech, he went on to say, of Americans feeling the extreme poverty of the Great Depression, that They've got the money, because there's as much money in the country as there ever was. Fewer people have it, but it's there. And a year later, after the next election, he clarified what he meant by that. The money was appropriated for the top in the hopes that it would trickle down to the needy. Mr. Hoover was an engineer. He knew that, that water trickles down. Put it uphill, and let it go, and it'll reach the driest little spot. But he didn't know that money trickles up. Give it to the people at the bottom, and the people at the top will have it before night anyhow but at least it will have passed through the poor fellow's hands. And one year after he said this, Franklin Delano Roosevelt figured out how to do just that with his New Deal, a collection of programs now regarded as socialist, especially as they include the creation of the Social Security Administration. Now, mark that point in our American history and compare how we were before and after that. In the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s, Americans enjoyed the highest standard of living of anywhere ever. Soviet citizens occasionally saw our movies and saw how well we lived with our fancy cars and color TV. And I knew a Russian communist who now lives in America who said that when she was in Soviet Russia that you know, everyone was patriotic and they would pull together and make sacrifices for the common good. But she says eventually, color TV wins. <laughs> That's how we won the Cold War, she said. 
It was that we had a higher standard of living and other people wanted to emulate that. That was enviable. We had human rights and we cared about that. That was enviable. That is what made America great. Then we started to slip. I remember back in the day, back in the 80s, going to see Ozzy Osbourne and Judas Priest. It was $15 to get in right next to the stage and they had dollar drafts, which is good because minimum wage was only like $3.35. Last year, I went to go see Ozzy and Judas Priest. <laughs> it was 150 bucks to get in several yards from the stage and beer was $10 a cup. But even though everything was 10 times more expensive, minimum wage is only twice as much. And that's to say nothing about how much college cost then as compared to now. For a few decades after the New Deal and World War II, despite Korea and Vietnam and several severe racial issues going on at home, Americans on average had it great, at least in terms of our overall standard of living. However, in the decades before the New Deal, Living conditions in industrial American cities were often abysmal. Remember that this is a time when a dozen people might share a single apartment. Adequate sanitation facilities didn't yet exist, so public water was filthy, and food from a store was even less safe than eating wild game. Castor oil and liver pills and other such elixirs were advertised as cure-alls. I saw an ad for Pepsi-Cola that showed this pretty little girl with the old-fashioned clothing and everything, and says, see how fair her skin grows day to day. She uses Pepsi-Cola as if Pepsi cures acne. <laughs> false advertising like that was legal then, and industries could get away with anything. There was no such thing as truancy because there were no laws mandating primary education, so young children, even six or seven years old, worked all day, every day, in dangerous factories with no days off, no vacation time, no sick leave, and no employee health coverage. That's how corporations treated children. Imagine how bad it was for the elderly with no pensions or social security and having to live with their kids if they still had any living. Now imagine the ecological damage of uncontrolled levels of industrial pollution being pumped into public waterways to say nothing of the smog and deforestation and other issues we get from the industrial revolution. A combination of unions and regulatory committees had to be invented and implemented to correct and control some of that and thus they have become part of what have made America great as they are improving our standard of living. Yet we frequently hear from corporate oligarchs who want to do away with the unions as well as regulations, restrictions, and guidelines and let corporations do whatever they want as if we didn't already know exactly what they will do the moment you look away. I've seen public statements to the effect that the Republican Party is effectively owned and controlled by the Koch brothers, moguls of the fossil fuel industry. So how obvious is it when they say they want to abolish the, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency that that means we will have no agency to protect the environment from the industries who bought the politicians so that these inhumane entities will be off the chain to do all the damage they want to do. And we already know what the corporatocracy will do. We saw that at Standing Rock. My wife and I went up there exactly three years ago. We were up there exactly three years ago today just to prove that that was really happening to try and publicize it since none of, our, none of our national news channels would cover that story. It was a media blackout. The only way we knew about it was by internet news from activists going up there to tell people what was going on that the powers that be didn't want us to know about. If you don't know about it, let me tell you that the primary point of that dispute was to stop an oil pipeline from being built in and thus destroying the local river. All these pipelines end up springing leaks. Uh, that poison the water supply. And there were already hundreds of pipelines all simultaneously leaking thousands of gallons all over the country at the same time that this demonstration was going on. And these people at the Standing Rock Dakota Sioux were trying to protect their only source of drinking water. Standing Rock became a demonstration of how corporate owned and corrupted government officials are actively suppressing all of our First Amendment rights. Congress shall make no law even respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Native Americans are typically very spiritual people and not trusting of atheists, but representatives of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe did agree to meet with us in a secret location off-site because that was the only way we could get the interviews we were looking for. We learned that tribal spirits never stood a chance against any god backed by American financial interests. Construction continued illegally 
illegally, even despite imposed suspension for court hearings. Because you're going to do it anyway. It doesn't matter what anybody says. For example, in one case, while the courts heard testimony to save a sacred burial site, the governor and his minions and cronies were all on the religious right, bulldozed the site to render the court hearings irrelevant. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, but as I already told you, the only reporters that were there were from internet news sources like Democracy Now! And two of their reporters were threatened with 45-year prison sentences for reporting the news. Whatever happened to freedom of speech or of the press? The chief of the Dakota Sioux knew that he couldn't get the word out in the, U in the US, so he went to Europe and announced it to the United Nations so that at least someone would know what was happening to them and help began pouring in from all over the country and even from other countries. Congress shall make no law abridging the right of the people to peaceably assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. Yet, for months and months, the Dakota Sioux literally stood their ground with the support of other tribes and thousands of American military veterans and other volunteers of every ethnicity in a human blockade trying to stop the steady encroachment of the Dakota Access Pipeline construction crews. Those unarmed and non-threatening water protectors who risked their own safety by facing state police on the front lines were maced, attacked by or bitten by attack dogs, hit with water cannons, tear gas grenades, and rubber bullets. They were also routinely arrested over and over again because it was never a charge that could hold them and keep them from going back because this wasn't just about protecting the water for one remote tribe of rural people in some forgotten reservation. This was about standing against the oligarchs of the United States itself, who obviously saw these people as an impediment to the investments of major corporations from everyone from Goldman Sachs to Wells Fargo was invested in this pipeline and a bunch of hippies were not gonna stop them. The day before we arrived, North Dakota became the first state in American history to legalize weaponized drones against its own citizenry. I kid you not, look it up if you don't believe me. They didn't implement that, probably because they realized the publicity that would inevitably come from it. There were no TV cameras up there, but everything they did still got on Facebook and YouTube. So instead, three years ago tonight, the Standing Rock camp was crop dusted by a small plane buzzing low over the campsite over and over again, dropping some unknown chemical substance on the people below, which I can only assume was a terror tactic meant to, you know, to deter and confuse and, and to terrify these people. It's just one of many terror tactics the state employed, but that did not work. At one point, I, I know how this sounds, but at one point, the Justice League arrived to help. <laughs> the actors who played Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Cyborg, Aquaman, and Lois Lane all showed up to show that they were heroes in real life by trying to bring publicity to a plight that official news stations were trying to keep quiet. Mark Ruffalo, who played the Incredible Hulk in the Adventures franchise, donated a solar-powered charging station so that the, the water protectors could charge their cell phones and other devices so they could keep recording everything. Because of efforts like this from a celebrated few, including the goddamn super friends, Enough people found out what the American corporatocracy was doing to its own countrymen and for what, that once they, once they called in the famous environmental activist Aaron Brockovich to sue the US government in what promised to be a very high profile court case, President Obama realized there would be so much publicity of indefensible corporate greed that there would be no way to come out of this clean. He was forced to do the right thing. Now, the Army Corps of Engineers had already condemned the project some time earlier, so Obama used that as the public excuse to finally let it go. He called off construction, which is huge, because he had personally invested his own money into this pipeline. So had Hillary. And she came out in defense of the pipeline. She made public statements defending the pipeline, while Bernie, of course, took the side of the water protectors. Yeah. And even though she was personally invested, we know, we have good reason to believe that had she won the election that was then going on, that she would have stuck by what Obama declared. But she didn't win that election. Instead, America lost its mind. 
and elected an unqualified, incompetent madman. Trump is unreasonable because he doesn't understand things. He's not a leader, he's a crime boss. He only cares about profit and he has no competence even in that, having failed at virtually every business he's ever operated, including the ones that normally can't fail. He had a million dollars invested in that pipeline too, so he ignored the president, the precedent of the previous president and started construction up again within the first few days of his term, despite public outcry, which he then pretended not to know about as if he'd never heard of Standing Rock and didn't even know there was an issue there, because when has he ever been honest about anything? This time, construction plowed through unchallenged with the benefit of a new law, such that peaceful protesters could no longer impede commercial developments. To no one's surprise, the pipeline ruptured in that first year spilling 407,000 gallons of crude oil into the Dakota Sioux's only water supply. And I just saw the news that it happened again two days ago, spilling another 383,000 gallons into their water just this week. There used to be provisions under the law to protect against that sort of thing, but Trump repealed that law so that it's now legal for industries to pollute public waterways. That was the 85th environmental protection statute that Trump disabled in his insane quest to enrich himself by destroying the world. It's my opinion, I'm entitled to it. It's not just that Donald Trump is a serial cheater at everything, whose heroes are all murderous dictators. It's so much worse than that. Trump is an incoherent, incompetent, criminally corrupt, willfully ignorant, amoral, unfaithful, unethical, crooked, fraudulent, narcissistic, pathological liar, a racist, fascist shyster, a business failure, dangerous science denier, and apparently demented traitor with the reading level, speech, and intellectual capacity of a fourth grader with no comprehension, with no compunction, no conscience, no awareness of history or geography, no appreciation of or understanding of science, and no concern for the environment either. And now I feel among friends. <laughs> Trump said that climate change was a hoax perpetuated by China in order to make American industries non-competitive. Never mind that China created 13 million jobs by investing $350 billion into renewable energy. They're the world's biggest producer of solar panels. They build another wind turbine every hour, and they increase their sales of electric cars a thousand percent, all in the first year of Trump's term, while he promised to reopen coal mines which will never provide jobs again due to automation. And back in 1971, I was told that America was better than any other country because we wisely preserved our natural wilderness in national parks, which we are now fracking. Yes. I would bet that any group of you could spend the next hour compiling a list of Trump's failures and crimes just against the environment, but let me tell you one of the worst ones that you probably don't know anything about. Did you know that wolves were once extinct in North America. They went extinct in the 1970s, and there was a conservation effort to reintroduce them in places like Yosemite National Park. Then, within the year that they were taken off the endangered species list, Trump issued an official statement that anyone at any time without a license could use any weapon or trap, no matter how cruel, to kill as many wolves as they can, even using tracking be beacons on their collars, as says they were part of a conser conservation effort, to track these wolves and destroy them without any sense of humanity, compassion, or shame. I've never seen a word of this on the news. I only know about it because my stepdaughter works for wolf conservation. She showed me graphic, disturbing pictures of razor wire wolf traps and other horrors, and she is understandably livid about the sick, sadistic evil that is Donald Trump. But if any of y'all heard about any of, the, any of this at all, it was probably that Trump also made it legal to lob hand grenades into dens of hibernating bears to hopefully blow up their cubs while they sleep. Now let's set ecology aside and talk about the economy. The one good thing anyone can say about our marmalade Mussolini. (Laughter) 
that he gave his rich cronies and their companies a tax break at the expense of everyone else and the economic fallout that will inevitably result from that. Knowing, as Will Rogers already did way back in 1932, that trickle-down economics don't work, it's surprising to me the damage that Ronald Reagan did with our economy by trying it again in the 1980s. More amazing still is that even after that, we see the current administration doing it again. The end result that we saw before and that we're still seeing repeated is a diminishing middle class until we become a third world nation having divided the haves from the have-nots. That must be the plan because it's the only explanation for why the GOP is adamantly against any means of birth control pretending to be pro-life, while simultaneously defunding every method of assistance for young and or single parents, including public education and especially by prohibiting sex education, which creates a positive feedback loop of babies having babies so that we have more and more impoverished and desperate, ignorant kids every year. Any idiot could see the math behind that equation, and while politicians can be impressively stupid, I don't think this is an accident of ignorance. I think they've got to be doing it on purpose. Maybe that's why our politicians are mostly evangelical. American Christian nationalists are following the same playbook as Catholicism took back in the old days. Give me that old-time religion. Remember all those Trump supporters who assured us that Trump would never attack LGBTQ people? <laughs> then he barred trans people from serving in the military? Two days ago, the Trump administration announced that anyone receiving a Department of Health and Human Services grant can discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, gender, sex, and religion. So Betsy DeVos can use her government-funded adoption agency to adopt out migrant children stolen from their parents at the border, but can turn down LGBTQ single women, religious non-Christians, and even you unbelieving infidels in this room can be denied as adopters on the basis of the fact you have no religion. The language of exclusion based on identity is so vague that an HHS grant recipient, such as a homeless shelter, can turn away homeless people based on trans identity or even their race. Before anyone brings up the courts, Trump, who is beholden to the Christian nationalists, has packed the Supreme Court and is filling the lower courts, too, with Christian culture warriors. It's not a free market for issue for Christians who use the government grants to discriminate either because all of us, including the 20% of the nation that are non-religious, pay taxes to support the HHS grants, but our money, our own money, is being handed to Christian nationalists so that they can use it to discriminate against us. Christian nationalists are regressing, undoing all of our progress, and turning back the clock to the 1950s when only rich, straight, white, Anglo-Saxon Protestants had rights. Absolutely. And I, I forgot to mention men there. <laughs> <laughs> Opening the door to religious discrimination by our government all against queer folk doesn't mean that anyone can slam that door shut again when Christian nationalists start discriminating against the non-religious. Not that anyone should have been so callous as to help open the door for such discrimination, which includes we atheists also. Although no one should have been arguing such for an irrationally optimistic view that this door be left open for Trump, who was already, already was obviously a Christian nationalist puppet in 2016. There is no closing that barn door after the cows have already trampled civil rights, including our own. There is one thing that I think really did make America great. It was the fact that our government was intended to be secular, that Congress shall make no law establishing religion, even though you know, we did. Because once the state has a religion, that means that every other religion is subject to that one and must give reverence to that one, which means that believers in any other religion or no religion at all are all second-class citizens. But if the state doesn't show any preference for religion and doesn't require observance of any religion, then you, lo you lose all the prejudice that immigrants might have been raised with back in the old world, such that it doesn't matter if you're Protestant or Catholic, because both have been killing each other for hundreds of years, and it doesn't matter if you're Sunni or Shia, because they've been killing each other for centuries too, and the same goes for Hindus and Sikhs, Hellenists and Zoroastrians, and the handful of us who don't believe in anything supernatural, and they are therefore right. <laughs> The one true religion is no religion at all, and any belief that requires faith should be rejected for that reason. The point is, 
that it doesn't matter what they believe politically or religiously back in the old country. The caste system and all that interdenominational conflict and superstitious tribal nonsense don't exist here and has no relevance to who or what you are now. Welcome to the meritocracy, where it all comes down to what you can do. It's not, it, it's not that you, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, but it is true that if you couldn't make it anywhere else, you might still be able to make it here. So this is the best place to be. It was supposed to be that it doesn't matter what your ancestral beliefs or race or national origin are, all that matters is what you can do with this opportunity. That is the American dream. That, more than anything else, is the precedent that America set that was unique in all the world and it never existed anywhere else before. That's why Lady Liberty says, give me your tired, your weak, your huddled masses yearning to be free, because I was told when I was a kid that this was the promised land. This was the place everyone wanted to be because it's the best place to be and it was a haven from all of the evil and oppression and equality going on everywhere else that shouldn't happen here. That's the greatest thing there ever was about this country, the American dream. And it's no surprise that Donald Trump made a public announcement on television that the American dream is dead because he's the one that fucking killed it with his bigoted, xenophobic, ignorant, elitist prejudice and his illusion of racial superiority. I'm sorry to say, that my father, too, suffered from a similar problem. My dad once told me that America's the best damn country there is, and I don't need to know about nowhere else. <laughs> he said those exact words to me, and I don't think he realized what he was admitting. My problem is that I do know about somewhere else. I've been fortunate enough to visit a couple of dozen different countries in the last few years, and it's hard to be the patriot that my father was or that my family still is. When you go to so many other countries and you see that everybody does something better than we do. I remember getting outraged when I was a little kid thinking, why do the Germans build the best beer, make the best beer, and the, the Swiss make the best watch? And why don't, why, why, we're Americans. Why don't we make the best damned everything? No, no, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> and many of these other countries have progressed beyond where we are. And we're now moving backwards. It's like the tortoise and the hare where we are sleeping by the side of the road having wet dreams. That we're number one, we're number one. And all these other tortoise countries are quietly passing us by, shaking their head at what a sad and disturbing sight we are. <laughs> Pretty soon we're either going to have to wake the fuck up and become who we pretend to be, or realize that we've already become just as slow and thick and cold-blooded as the other tortoises we're making fun of. And I, my rant is now done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, what a finish. <laughs> I don't know if I could see you mouthing the words out there, but I think a lot of you were thinking a lot of that. And uh, so thanks for bringing it home, Arn. Appreciate you being here.